What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am and today I've got two stories for you guys that are going to be harrowing tales of survival. People that were stranded at sea for insane spans of time. First up we have Steve Callahan who's a man known for surviving 76 days stranded at sea on a life raft. Basically this guy Steve Callahan he was a little bit of a daredevil a little bit of a guy who was uh, always up for an adventure and he wanted to participate in this uh, sailing race I guess it was a thing where you kind of had to make a boat or have one already made of a certain size to participate in this little race and so he makes this little sailboat to participate in this race but he ends up dropping out of the race in Spain and he drops out of the race because there's been a bunch of bad weather and it sinks a bunch of boats in the race and it damages a bunch of others and one of the ones that gets damaged and you know can still float but not very well is his boat. So he drops out of the race in Spain and right there he kind of makes some repairs to his boat, enough to continue the journey but not race, and he starts working his way down the coast of Spain and Portugal. And somewhere off the coast of Portugal, he becomes swamped because something in the middle of the night in a storm hits into his boat. And when something hits into his boat it makes this hole and water starts flooding in. And the way that Steve had designed this boat, it had a bunch of sealed watertight compartments, so it wouldn't sink all the way, but it like definitely isn't going to keep moving as a boat anymore and so it kind of starts to sink and he realizes that his chances aren't very good to get this going again and he's probably going to have to abandon into his life raft and so he spends the day kind of you know taking in what's going on understanding like if there's anything he can do to fix the situation and he's looking at this hole and he thinks it could have been made by the middle of the night during the storm bumping into a whale which would just really have to be the worst luck ever all right you've already been damaged by a storm once but now on top of it you literally have a hole in the side of your boat because you hit into a whale. Anyways, his boat's starting to take on more and more water because those watertight compartments are great, but over time they're kind of leaking. He finally decides to get in his life raft. So he gets into the life raft and he keeps kind of diving back into the boat to get more and more stuff into the life raft. And he doesn't really get that much stuff. He gets an emergency kit containing some food, some charts, you know. He gets a spear gun and a survival kit with flares, solar stills, all that good stuff. Everything you would expect to be in a life raft and he finally just hops in and he finally pushes off. And so at this point he's in his life raft still kind of next to this half sunken raft thing he's made hoping that that would be easier for people to find him in. And right before dawn on the night he's sleeping in this life raft there's this like big wave in the sea and it finally takes the uh, boat all the way down to the bottom and it pushes the life raft off to sea. And so he gets pushed off to sea and he's just kind of drifting because you're in a life raft there's really no way to control it. You can't sail. There's not an easy way to like navigate in a life raft. And he starts having to ration all of his materials. He only had gotten a small amount of food in his sailboat and that's gone relatively quickly. And after that's gone, he realizes that he has to start fishing to survive. So he uses the spear gun he found and some other things and he starts literally catching fish out of his life raft to make sure that he can have enough sustenance to survive. And so he's out in the middle of the ocean and he's eating mahi-mahi and trigger fish which he's which he spears and along with fish he starts to like catch birds that would land on his raft to you know have a place to sit in the ocean barnacles that had started to grow on his raft he would eat and as I said in the beginning he's out on the ocean for an insanely long time like 76 days and when you're just drifting in the sea for 76 days you have the ability to get into currents and just move insane distances and so here he is in this life raft right literally fishing over the side with a spear gun, capturing birds, drinking their blood, and during this, the sea is pushing him, and he ends up moving over 3,300 kilometers during this journey. So, basically, you know, almost circumnavigates the globe mile-wise while just sitting in this life raft, doing everything he can to survive. And while he's doing all of this, going these crazy distances, having the survival story, he's constantly trying to be rescued. It's not like he's not trying. He's using this, like, emergency position radio thing, trying to signal a plane or something to come get him. And the flares that he had, he uses sparingly, but he's just not able to get anyone to notice him. And he really thought the radio beacon was going to work, but like just simply very unfortunately, at the time, satellites weren't looking for those emergency beacons. It wasn't something that they were able to pick up. So the only way that anyone would have found it is if they flew over him in a plane, right? But this guy's luck is so bad that he ends up in the most desolate part of the ocean where there's just like 
nothing near him to pick up this signal. So he uses his flares, he's got this emergency radio beacon, and even with that, no one's able to find him. And to make matters worse, while he's drifting this 3,300 kilometers, he sees nine ships. He ended up crossing two sea lanes, you know, but he's this tiny little life raft out on the ocean, and these are ginormous ships that he can barely see. There's no way that they're gonna be able to see him. So he just kinda has to watch as these massive ships keep going past him. He's trying to signal him he's screaming, but when you're out on the ocean and there's these insane distances, it's just easy to not get noticed. But even through all of this, most people would have given up, right? Like, personally, by the time the ninth ship just goes past me, I'm probably ready to call it a day, stop drinking bird blood for water. But he didn't. He was exercising the entire time, he was trying to navigate by the stars, he made repairs to his boat, he was fishing, he was improving water collection systems. Honestly, it was like he knew he was going to survive the whole time. That was his number one priority. The way that he had stockpiled food and water was almost like, you know, it wasn't a matter of if he was going to get rescued, but when. And thankfully, because he's not giving up, on April 20th, 1982, he finally is in this spot, and he can see lights off of an island on this, like, little spot southeast of Guadalupe. And he starts kind of preparing to try to find a way to signal everybody that he's there, because he hasn't been able to see, like, lights on an island this entire time, and he can finally see civilization right there. And finally, the next morning, the 76th day that this guy is in this boat afloat on this raft, these fishermen just stumble upon him and pick him up. And the reason that they even notice that something's over there is they're like, huh, there's a bunch of birds just like floating around this raft. And basically, because he had been in it for so long, there had been this little ecosystem developed around it, and so birds were drawn there. And they had just gone over to see what the birds were drawn to, and sure enough, here's this life raft that's been in the sea for 76 days. And so they get him on board and they start talking to him and they can't believe this story because he gets in, he says he's been afloat for 76 days and over the 76 days he's had to fight sharks, he's fixed his raft, he's had to replace equipment, you know, he's been exhausted, he's mentally stressed out, he's lost a third of his body weight and he's covered with like sores of, of all these things, you know, sunburns, saltwater sores. And so they kind of, the fishermen realize, oh my gosh, this guy's not kidding and they take him to a hospital. Hospital. And he's only in the hospital for an evening. Like, after that, he leaves, he just starts to recover on the island, and he only spends a few weeks having to recover after this entire disaster before he decides to start hitchhiking on boats up through the West Indies. So, uh, yeah, basically, this dude literally spent 76 days just drifting in the ocean, like, just hell-bent on surviving, fishing, sustaining himself the entire time, and just honestly had to have been one of the most harrowing experiences of all time. And even after the fact, he wasn't that bitter about it. He even described the experience as like having a few positive elements, you know? He said the night sky was basically a view from heaven in a seat in hell, you know? And he still to this day sails the sea. He still like hasn't decided to give up boating at all. And uh, yeah, since his survival drift, he hasn't really cared. He's been in plenty of offshore passages and ocean crossings. And most of them have been very small with like only a crew of two or three people. Next up, we're going to be talking about the story of Will Slattery, which is basically a guy who jumped out of a plane into the ocean and then survived for 24 hours stranded in the sea with, like, no boat. Just an absolute legend and uh, definitely deserves to have his story told. So, it starts like this. Will Slattery and five other dudes decide that they want to go skydiving. You know, it, it's a great time. They're going to have this great view. Everything's going to be great. And somewhere in between takeoff and where they were supposed to be skydiving, there's this huge burst of plane turbulence, which leads to everybody just panicking. And somewhere in this panic, something happens that basically leaves them with two options. They can either go down with the plane that's now going down, or jump out of the plane, and because they were going to skydive, they've had parachutes on already. And the turbulence is, is really bad. Like, it's so bad to the point where the door is having a hard time opening on the plane, and all six people on the plane are trying to get this door open, and finally, after four Four tries, they get it open, the turbulence just keeps slam slamming it shut. And due to the turbulence, they don't really know their altitude, they don't know how high they are in the air, they don't really have time to like look and take stock of everything. They don't have time to look around and see what the conditions are, they just kind of have to be like jumping. And so Will jumps out of this plane and he's just soaring through the sky, you know, everything's still kind of chaotic, he can't really tell where he is, and he's falling pretty quick, and after eight seconds of being in the air, his automatic chute just pops. And when you're automatic
static chute pops, it means that you're traveling at an insanely fast velocity. And so his chute pops, and as soon as he's kind of falling slower, he starts looking around the sky, looking for everybody else from the plane that had jumped out. And he sees one of his friends, Jimmy, kind of gliding very, very far away really quickly. And so he keeps looking around, and his friend Manny is basically next to him, and they're kind of flying the same direction. And so he starts calling out to Manny to try to coordinate where they're going to land. And Manny, it looks like, had been knocked out by just the sheer g-force of the emergency chute pulling like the force had kind of knocked him out because his head had kind of been limp and laying down like he was sleeping and the chute had pulled but it was like he wasn't awake and so obviously the emergency suit triggers when you're going very quick so that he's still hurtling towards the ocean at 40 miles per hour and he realizes that like most of my friends don't have a very good chance of making it out of here and so he plummets into the ocean and he kind of gets his chute off of him so it doesn't drag him down and he gets kind of tied up in the cord of the parachute so he's trying to stay calm while obviously being pulled down to the bottom of the ocean in a parachute not the most relaxing thing ever and piece by piece he starts taking off all this gear and it takes him two to three minutes of treading water while getting this off of him to finally get all of the the wires and everything off of him and so he's untangled and it's at this point he realizes that the plane had crashed right behind him because he turns around and he can see the wing kind of sticking out of the water where it had plummeted into the ocean and so he realizes that all right the plane's down i got the parachute off me now i'm gonna go try to find anybody so he takes off his shirt he takes off his shoes so he can swim a little bit better and he starts going to try to find manny the guy that had passed out in the air see if he can you know maybe find him he's floating or something he thinks maybe if he gets to him quick enough he can keep his head above the water so he can keep breathing and so he starts just kind of swimming towards where he could have landed because manny's not answering anything and as he's swimming over there he doesn't see him he doesn't see a parachute it's just like everything is gone and at that point he really starts to freak out because all of his friends are gone he has no clue where any of them are and he just has to accept the fact that he's literally alone in the middle of the ocean he has no supplies no boat in his shorts just floating there and so he starts looking around to see like all right maybe i can see land in a direction and i'll start swimming that way or maybe i'll see planes overhead and like go the opposite direction because that means they just took off from there but as he starts to take inventory of everything around him he sees nothing and the only thing that starts to play in his mind is that he's in shark infested water because that he is and he's like this is just the worst thing ever and once he realizes he's in shark infested water and that fear kicks in he starts to even think about like okay well maybe it's better that I get eaten by sharks instead of just treading water until I slowly sit below the surface like you know maybe that's the better option and the fact that he even was taking inventory of options like that goes to show just how bad the situation was like this is not a good place to be and so he's kind of uh, shaken and he starts to just realize that there's a very very low likelihood of any help coming either because he's not in America you know we have the Coast Guard out here if a plane went down they'd know they'd come investigate pretty quickly you know still not great if you're just treading water but you've got a chance but this dude is just chilling in some random country so the odds of a coast guard coming is slim to none and it's basically on himself to try to figure out a way to survive this meanwhile while he's stuck in the middle of the ocean the people on the ground are standing there waiting for the guys to come land from their skydiving event you know what I mean so they're standing there and sure enough nobody's coming even if they landed elsewhere uh, they would have called her they would have found a way to locate her and so the person who owns this company is waiting at the landing zone for pickup they never come so she goes back to the airstrip to figure out what's going on thinking maybe they just canceled it the weather was too bad and so she gets to the airstrip and is standing there for 20 minutes and realizes oh crap they're not here they did not come back so at that point the panic alarm is sounded they realize something must have happened to this flight there must have been an accident something good has not happened but obviously that takes time and by the time people start looking on the ocean for them it's been five hours and five hours later it's dark and will is just struggling to tread water at that point imagine treading waters for five hours straight in the pitch black he can't see anything around him and that hopelessness starts to creep into him but thankfully as that hopelessness is starting to like take over him he starts to see lights in the distance and he gets like this burst of energy and he starts to swim towards the light and he's doing the backstroke because he's just finding it a little bit easier and he's doing like 30 backstrokes and then 
flipping over and seeing where the light is and he's flipping and starts to go towards the light and he finally starts to get close to this light right and the tide kicks up and starts pulling him back out into the ocean like he had finally started to make ground on it and sure enough all the ground he's making starts to go away and once he had kind of had this burst of energy towards the light and then been pulled back out to sea he kind of accepts the fact like I'm gonna die you know that effort to keep trying kind of leaves and he just decides that like everything I've tried isn't working I just have to accept it and they had been searching a little bit during the day but the uh, Costa Rican emergency services they say that they're not gonna search at night it's too dangerous and so for nine hours Will is just floating in the water he's dehydrated because all this seawater is being pushed into his mouth he starts to get attacked by jellyfish just stinging him all over salt water's hitting the jellyfish wounds this guy's just in the absolute worst place you could possibly be and so once he starts to get stung by the jellyfish he's like I gotta get out of here so he starts to swim away but he ends up swimming into more jellyfish like into the the clump of them he finally gets through them and as soon as he gets through those jellyfish he's like oh my gosh it just can't get worse and he starts to see something coming at him and he's like great there's a crocodile coming out me so he starts to freak out going into shock thinking just why why is everything going against me and after about 10 minutes this thing that's approaching him comes towards him and he's like here it is the crocodile's coming to get me but it's a log and as soon as he sees the log a little bit of hope comes back because he grabs onto it and it kind of gives him a life raft like something to float up on and so now 10 hours into treading water he's got a log which is going to make it a little bit easier to stay afloat and at this point the news has reached everybody everybody's panicking everybody's starting to search for him they're trying to get everybody out there to go look for him but it still takes another uh couple 12 14 hours before he would be rescued and so 15 hours into this entire ordeal he falls asleep on the log somehow survives through the night and so the daylight is up now and he can see land relatively far away but close enough where he thinks he can get to it so he's just kind of riding the tide he's too exhausted to really swim himself so he's just kind of on this log floating into the beach and he just kind of slowly again gets pushed back out to sea he rides it in for an hour and then the tide turns and pulls him back out and so for the second time during this 15 hour period he gets so close to being rescued only to be dragged back out and so a little bit after that you know a couple hours later he's just floating on this log and finally he's like I I've got to get rid of the log I have to get rid of the log it just keeps pulling me further and further out to sea because this current isn't me pushing inland anymore my only hope for survival is to get rid of it so he gets rid of the log and at this point he's been treading water for nearly a whole day so the exhaustion gets him pretty quick he starts to go under the water and he realizes that you know if help doesn't come in the next few minutes there's a pretty good chance they're never gonna find him and it just is what it is and all of a sudden as he's literally preparing himself to die drifting off preparing to go underwater he thinks he hears a boat and part of him is as he's going under the water is like well this is a hallucination like what a cruel trick the last thing my brain's gonna do to me is make me think that I hear a boat like this is just ridiculous but something prompts him to like look and he looks and he sees a boat and he starts waving to them and he's like all right well this is a hallucination they won't see this but all of a sudden the boat starts coming towards him right and once the boat starts coming towards him he lays back into the water and just kind of collapses but sure enough the next thing that he remembers seeing is three men on a fishing boat that are like looking over him dragging him into the boat and somehow after 24 hours literally just floating in the ocean nothing good happening the entire time jellyfish crocodile scares the entire thing he gets rescued by this fishing boat in the middle of nowhere anyways guys that's gonna do it for the video hopefully you enjoyed if you did I would really appreciate you taking a second to press the like button let me know in the comment section down below what you thought and of course subscribe if you're new and turn on those notifications if you really want to help me out link to the podcast scuffed cast will be down below or you could use code scrubby at the G fuel checkout it's a great way to help me out and get a discount on G Fuel so everyone's a winner. And uh, other than that, be sure to check out the Halloween merch. I'll put a link at the top of the description. It's pretty fantastic if I get to say so myself and you should check it out. And uh, yeah, on that note, don't get anyone pregnant. If you do, make sure they're hot. And I'll see you guys next time. I'm out. Peace.